So we're on, I think it's lesson, I, I found a copy, thank you. Lesson 21, if I counted correctly, um, on the glory of God. And this uh, has been based on this book, uh, I think it's been mentioned a few times, edited by Christopher Morgan and Robert Peterson. The first many lessons in the series were um, a biblical theology. Uh, if you look at the beginning of the outline there, um, how do truths about God's glory shape our view and approach to pastoral ministry? So the first section, the first, I think, 17 lessons were b biblical theology, really, um, which seeks to understand the progressive unfolding of God's special revelation throughout history. And so we looked at from the Old Testament uh, through the Gospels and much of the New Testament, um, the topic of the glory of God. Then the last three lessons were uh, Ryan um, putting together a systematic theology that um, seeks to present the entire scriptural teaching on certain specific truths or doctrines, and so he did that for three lessons. And now today we're going to look at uh, how these truths about God's glory shape our view and approach to pastoral ministry. And so there, there were a number of different authors, uh, writers, uh, who contributed to this book. Uh, this subject, this topic, uh, was um, addressed by Brian Chappell. And the, the heart of it, really, uh, of the lesson is uh, how a pastor um, fulfills the, the offices to the church of prophet, priest, and king as an ambassador of Christ. Um, and so we'll get to that specific, more specifically later, but there are a few um, uh, more, I guess, I don't, I don't want to say practical, but um, a few other considerations before we get to that. And uh, one of those is very basic to the gospel and um, in much of, of Christendom today, there is a, a false gospel that's preached that um, promises personal well-being. Um, it, in its, you know, generally understood to be the prosperity gospel, but. Um, in the context of the of the subject of glory, the the uh, focus really becomes. Is this thing like pull it away? Okay. Personal glory, um, personal blessing, um, and you know, for for those who are under that teaching and and who. Uh, in whom those kinds of expectations are created uh, when they're told that um, they need Jesus in their lives, uh, there's inevitably uh, disappointment. It's, uh, it, it certainly is not the case that uh, if you become a follower of Christ, you are going to be healthy and wealthy and um, whatever else it is that they're promising. That not, It doesn't exclude that possibility, but uh, 
when that expectation is created, it's the, the, the gospel really becomes about the person's personal glory. And so there are disappointments. Um, you know, why didn't I become wealthy? <laughs> well, you didn't give enough money. You know, your faith wasn't strong enough. Like, I feel like I'm going to have to bend this thing out of the way or something. Sorry. Um, and so, uh, rightly preaching the word of God is um, to emphasize uh, not your personal glory, but the glory of God. And that is, is sometimes a difficult um, experience for a believer. It's, so you're, you're wrestling with your own desires and your sin nature and, and you're, you're grappling with the uh, demands of the gospel, um, the requirements of the law, and, uh, and you're not happy. Why am I not happy? You know? Um, and so it becomes important as a foundational thing for a pastor to uh, communicate clearly, uh, as Scripture does, the uh, the, the the way in which our um, Christian experience can be joyful as we glorify God. What, what is it that, what are the things that have to get connected in our lives in order for our, our joy to be complete in glorifying God even when it comes at perhaps great discomfort, uh, difficulty, trials, um, and 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 may seem even burdensome at times and so it gets to the heart of what is what is conversion what is it what's really happening when in conversion what is the change that's taking place in a person that's going to result in that kind of uh, a joyful life in Christ even when it's tough. And um, I, I think it's it, it Samuel Bolton wrote a book, I, I don't have the exact year, a couple of hundred years ago, I think it was, um, True Bounds of Christian Freedom. How many of you are familiar with that? Okay, well, you can get it, it's a PDF, you can get it for free. Um, and I first came across it when we were doing the Law and Gospel study uh, a few months ago. I hope I don't electrocute myself drinking coffee. <laughs> Maybe I should have just used the mic. Um, I know I won't, I just... And... I, I thought that the way that he explained this, uh, the, the, this, this reality of conversion was, was one of the most helpful things I've come across. And so I'm going to read you an a, a excerpt from that book. But before I do that, I want to remind you of Ezekiel 36.26 which says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And so this description of the new covenant is, is central to this issue of joy in glorifying God 
and trials. Uh, and Brian Chapel in the in in the book just dis, discusses this in the context of uh, you know helping people understand the demands and delights of the Christian life. Um, Bolton speaks more of it in terms of delighting in duty. So, but it's the same subject, the same topic. And here's what Bolton said. All delight in duties arises from a suitability of spirit in the doing of them. If there is no grace within the heart to answer the call of duty from without, if there is no principle in the heart agreeable to the precept of the word, the heart will never delight in them. This then is the reason why a godly man conducts himself well in duty, not merely because it is commanded, but because he has the nature which truly and rightly responds to the command. The law of God, which is in the book, is transcribed into his heart. It is his nature, his new nature, so that he acts his own nature renewed as he acts obedience. The eye has no command to see, nor the ear to hear. It is their nature to see and hear. The faculty of seeing is the command to see. So far as the heart is renewed, it is as natural for it to obey as for the eye to see or the ear to hear as natural to live in obedience as for the fish to live in water or the bird in air. Thus it is that we do not obey merely because obedience is commanded. The mere command is for such as have no vital principle within them. But we obey from a principle which God has implanted in us suitable to the commands of God. We grant that the command is the rule apart from our obedience, but grace is the principle within the heart and the command answer to one another. As face answers face in the water or in a glass, so it is with the heart and the command. The command is transcribed in the heart. This is the reason why there is so much delight in the godly man's obedience, for it is natural to obey so far as the heart is renewed. So, when you're regenerated, when you're born again, when your heart has been transformed uh, into one that um, has been made to reflect more closely the image of God, the, the way that you were created and the way that man was originally created. When you've been restored to a point that's closer, it's not, it's not, it's not perfect, but it's closer, you, you, you have been regenerate. That, that law is written in your heart in a way that the command is received rightly. So it's, it's not a burden. It becomes a, a, a natural obedience, duty. Uh, the demands of the gospel become a uh, delight because your heart is new. It is, it, on it are written the laws of God in a way that... Um, is new and so uh, so to the extent that you're and the way Bolton puts it um, it is natural to obey so far as the heart is renewed so the extent to which you find the demands and duties of of the Christian life difficult or disagreeable 
is you could say the extent to which your heart is not sufficiently renewed. Um, and so, you know, we often say when there are uh, demands that are uh, clearly preached in terms of the, the duties of a Christian, and they're not received well, there's, there, there's pushback, or there's rebellion, there's um, disagreement uh, among the hearers, um, you know, will say, well, it's a heart issue. And, and it is. Um, so, uh, glorifying God uh, should be the natural outworking of a renewed heart. And, um, it, you know, it's important for uh, you know, pastors to preach that clearly and, and to make the glory of God the central issue um, uh, from reminding them even that the very reason they were created was for that purpose. So, you know, that's, a, that's one aspect of, you know, a, a pastoral theology of the glory of God um, as you've, you know, as you've listened to the, the previous lessons and, and gone through the, um, the different terms in the Bible and the, the, the way that they're used, um, you've, you've learned a lot about the specifics of, you know, how the, how the Bible describes the glory of God, but uh, one of the points that Brian Chapel makes is that in order for you to have a more complete understanding of the glory of God, you have to look at um, a couple of other things. One is the way that people respond to the glory of God. And um, often that looks like fear. Um, and so he, he gives us a few examples. He says, well, uh, and so the broader concern is um, not, not just the terminology, but the narratives. He's saying, you know, you, you need to look at the narratives of, uh, in the Bible to have a fuller understanding of the glory of God uh, uh, in addition to understanding the specific terms and, and the contexts of how they're used. But so, with one aspect of this, the, these narratives, um, Chapel says, we gain some measure of understanding what God's glory is by narrations of the response seen in his people when they behold it. And often it's fear. And he gives, he gives some examples. Um, Moses hides his face in the bush uh, hides his face before the burning bush. The people of Israel cower below a thundering Sinai. Isaiah wilts upon the sight of the seraphim around the throne of heaven. And the shepherds tremble as the glory of the Lord shone around them on the fields of Bethlehem. So in each case, the response to the glory of God is fear. Um, but he says, in each case, the Lord dampens that emotion with some disclosure of the purpose of his appearing. And that purpose is always connected to his care and concern for his people. And so, in the case of Moses, what he hears is that, uh, you know, uh, when he hides his face before the burning bush, Moses hears that he will deliver God's people. At Sinai, Israel learns that God will lead and protect. Isaiah receives the sweet burn of an atoning kiss, and the shepherds are calmed by an angel choir heralding the glory of, of peace on earth. And so, when even though there's 
often in, in response to the glory of God, the, you know, fear, there is a purpose uh, that God is accomplishing in that revelation of himself that helps us understand why or, or what, what a, a, um, a the, the right, a fuller understanding of the fear of God. What, what is it? And uh, Chapel says, in its right and mature expression, biblical fear is a humble and loving response to the character of God. Such fear rightly perceives the awesome and even terrifying power of God, but this perception is tempered with marveling that, no, that one so majestic is so concerned for his people. And he says, God is infinite in power, but intimate in love. So the narratives, uh, uh, you know, go beyond the, 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 the terminology that we've been looking at and, and, and help us understand more about the glory of God. But the central narrative, the, the, the one that it, it, uh, is the clearest example for us is Christ. And um, Chapel refers specifically to Isaiah's prophecies in chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, where he says that the coming Messiah, um, Isaiah prophesies the coming Messiah saying that, quote, the fear of the Lord um, will, quote, rest on him, and, quote, he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He's quoting verses 2 and 3. And so the, the fear of the Lord rests on Christ. He delights in the fear of the Lord, his God, his Father. Um, and that relationship between God the Father and God the Son ultimately exemplifies biblical fear. Um, I'm just going to read you a little more about what, how Chapel describes this. He says, Jesus' intimacy and humility with his heavenly Father reveals that his fear is proper regard for the full spectrum of divine attributes, including his wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, truth, and love. Our clearest and most powerful revelation of the glory of God comes from the one who most experienced it. Jesus is, quote, and he's, he's, he's quoting Hebrews 1, 3, the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And in Colossians 2, 9, in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in body form. Um, in 2 Corinthians he is the image of God made incarnate, quote, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so in Christ we have the, the maximum revelation of God, the, the maximum example of the glory of God. Um, glory is defined by the Son. And so, how does how does you know what aspects of uh, the glory of God do we do we f focus on? You know, as we hear the preaching of the word and we understand the work of Christ, uh, you know what He's accomplished, um, central to uh, His mission, of course, is. He came into the world to save sinners. Um, and so, glory is distinguished by redemption. And there's just... Um, And so so much <laughs> that can be said about the work of Christ and uh, his work in redemption. Um, but 
two things to think about in particular are that God intends to shine his glory through Jesus, but also to share, to share his glory through his son. So, we, we have the maximum revelation of God, we see the glory of God in Christ, uh, and that's one, you know, we're to behold that in, in, in our understanding of the glory of God. But um, the other aspect that, that we're looking at here is the, is the reality that he is, has come to share his glory with us. Uh, and this, you know, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about last week's sermon, Union with Christ. Um, the next series of uh, Sunday School lessons will be about union with Christ, which is, is going to be uh, awesome. Um, it's um, If you weren't here or you didn't hear last week's sermon, I encourage you to, to go back and, and listen to it. But um, part of that reality of our union with Christ is that Christ shares his life with us. Um, and so our, our life in Christ, our, our life in union with Christ is um, that we are walking in the spirit, walking with Christ, Christ indwelling us, Christ sharing our life, sharing his life with us. Um, and Peter speaks of this in 2 Peter 1.4 as being partakers of the divine nature. In 2 Thessalonians uh, 2.14, we read that um, Paul writes to them and, and the, the purpose of the gospel is that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and then in, in our life, in our experience in this present age, um, this union with Christ is... Um, him sharing his glory with us. Uh, Chapel speaks of this as glory shared in Christ likeness. And he says, we learn from the scope of biblical revelation that in the past we were created in Christ likeness, in the present we are restored and equipped for Christ likeness, and in the future we will have a perfected. Christ likeness and as I was reading this and thinking about this I was reminded of um, um, a book that Pastor Rick initially told me about a few years ago um, Thomas Boston's human nature and its fourfold state have any of you read that okay so now I've given you two books that you really need to read um, the, the, it was so, it's, it's just so good and, and the, the people in my on the west side group uh, you know have heard me talk about Thomas Boston you know if not every week it's, it's close <laughs> um, but in in this shared Christ likeness that that chapel is referring to uh, Boston really uh, expounds that in, in a way that uh, really helps me to understand the, the whole um, my life before Christ, my life with Christ, my future, yeah, 
uh, an eternity with Christ. Um, so in, in his book, Human Nature in Its Fourfold State, Thomas Boston says there, there you, and actually I think you can, I think this one is also available on PDF. Um, I, I, I think I saw it on monergism.com. He says, um, the four states of human nature are, and he just, the words he uses are primitive integrity, as the first one, entire depravity, the second one, begun recovery, the third one, and consummate happiness or misery. Those are the, the four states of human nature. They correspond to the four states of man um, in relation to sin as first enumerated by Augustine. And so these four states, if you'll listen to this, the first state, in the first state, so Adam is created able to sin and able not to sin. So he's different from us. Uh, in our, you know, we're born with a sin nature, and so that's really the second state, not able not to sin, slaves to sin. Uh, the third state is able not to sin. So once we're born again, freed from our slavery to sin, indwelled by the Spirit, we're able not to sin. Um, and then the fourth state is unable to sin. Really, a better state than Adam, right? The first state corresponds to the state of man in innocency before the fall. The second, the state of the natural man after the fall. The third, the state of the regenerate man. And the fourth, the glorified man. Um, and so, you know, it's human nature in its fourfold state. Um, connected with the glory of God in um, uh, bringing, you know, resurrecting us to new life um, uh, and ultimately to uh, glorifying him forever. And so, you know, as, as, we, as we preach Christ um, and and try to gr you know gr grapple with an understanding of the glory of God and how that relates to our life as Christians. It's it's helpful to see the 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 stages of Christ likeness um, in human nature and its fourfold states. So. Um, we're, it's a process of restoration. Um, God restores his glory in us through our union with Christ. And uh, so now we get to, you know, with, with sort of that foundation of the, the glory of God and, and what, is a, what is a right understanding um, of, of, of how a pastor should be communicating these things to his pe to the, the people. Um, we look more specifically at you know, how that works out in pastoral ministry. And if you've, on your uh, handout, um, if you look at, let's see, the Catechism Corner. Um, you know, I pull that, those questions from there because that's really the focus of the rest of this um, lesson is, you know, the pastor's role and how they relate to the offices of Christ. Um, and so look, the, the, the catechism, the, the Baptist catechism speaks to these things. How does Christ execute the office of a prophet? 
Christ executes the office of a prophet in revealing to us by his word and spirit the will of God for our salvation. So we will then in a minute look at what does that say about a pastor's role. Uh, question 29, how does Christ execute the office of a priest? Christ executes the office of a priest and is once offering up of himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. And then the third, how does Christ execute the office of a king? Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself in ruling and defending us and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. Those offices inform you know, how a pastor should um, undertake to glorify God and to lead the people in that direction. Of, of glorifying God. And so, uh, I want to look at, this This was um, the glory of God in the pastor's prophetic ministry. Um, it was kind of, it, there's a part of me that knew and understood this, but it was also very helpful to be reminded of this. Um, And Chapel puts it this way, by proclaiming the word, the pastor reflects Christ's prophetic office both in speaking about the glories of Christ and in speaking with the glory of Christ's own voice. Now, I'm not obviously saying that, you know, pastors become little gods. Um, that's not the point. Uh, but in Reformed theology, I want to read you some... Um, I I've, I found this on, on a church's website. Um, when you are under sound preaching, when the, the, the word of God is, is being rightly exposited and preached to you, it is the word of God, right? It is not the words of the pastor, not the words of men. It's the word of God. And you're to receive it as if God himself were speaking to you. It's um, a, a daunting and um, it, it's a fearful thing. You know, um, for uh, one of us to work to not get in the way of that, and it's we don't do that perfectly. You know, like um, we 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 labor to preach in a way that doesn't put the focus on ourselves and and how, you know how we're doing it but on what is God saying to you um, so I want to just read you some of these uh, and it goes back to before the Reformation the start there's a few a few quotes that speak to this issue of um, you know the reality that the word rightly preached to you is God's voice speaking to you. Chrysostom. And this is, lar this is really, if you look at the beginning of the handout, it's the, the verse at the very beginning. Um, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Most, most of the comments that I'm going to read to you are these men expositing or you know their commentaries on this verse where Paul says for this reason we also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God which you heard from us you welcomed it not as the word of men 
but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So Chrysostom says, um, for in hearing us, you gave such heed as if not hearing men, but as if God himself were exhorting you. Augustine said, um, yes, it is I who admonish, I who order, I who command, it is the bishop who teaches, but it is Christ who commands through me. The preacher explains the text. If he says what is true, it is Christ speaking. Martin Luther said, people generally think if I had an opportunity to hear God speak in person, I would run my feet bloody. But you now have the word of God in church and this is God's word as surely as if God himself were speaking to you. Calvin said, As often, therefore, as we hear the gospel preached by, by men, we ought to consider that it is not so much they who speak as Christ who speaks by them. And this is a singular advantage, that Christ lovingly allures us to himself by his own voice, that we may not by any means doubt the majesty of his kingdom. And here's another from Calvin, speaking of pastors. Christ acts by them in such a manner that he wishes their mouth to be reckoned as his mouth and their lips as his lips. That is, when they speak from his mouth and faithfully declare his word. Um, uh, Chapel quotes the second Helvetic confession of the Swiss reformers when he said, or he quoted it as saying, the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. And so he says, to the extent that our preaching is true to scripture, God's words yet echo in the church. His voice is available to his people even when it comes through our human mouths as pastors preach the truths of God's word. Um, the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 160. What is required of those who hear the word preached? It is required of those that hear the word preached that they attend upon it with diligence, preparation, and prayer, examine what they hear by the scriptures, receive the truth with faith, love, meekness, and readiness of mind as the word of God. Jeremiah Burroughs said, many times you will say, come let us go hear a man preach. Oh no, let us go hear Christ preach. For as it concerns the ministers of God that they preach not themselves, but that Christ should preach in them, so it concerns you that here, not to come to hear this man or that man, but to come to hear Jesus Christ. John Owen said, let a man but consider that it is God, the great and holy one, that speaketh unto him in his word, and it cannot but excite in him faith, attention, and readiness to obedience, as also work in him that awe, reverence, and trembling, which God delighteth in, and which brings the mind into a profiting frame. And this concerns the word preached as well as read. Um, there's another guy, I can't even pronounce his name, is Danish, I guess, Wilhelmus Brockel. Pa um, the minister must remind himself in a lively manner that God has sent him, and he, that he ascends the pulpit as an ambassador of God, speaks in the name of God, and is as the mouth of the Lord unto the congregation. And uh, just a couple more. Um, Mark Beach said, according to the classical reformed tradition, the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. 
or to state it more accurately, preaching, when accompanied by the Spirit's presence and power, is Christ's living voice to the church and world today. Christ is really present in the preaching of the gospel. And finally, Robert Spinney. Good preaching is not merely correct proclamation of the truth. It is God himself proclaiming his truth. Um, so, you know, remind yourself of that when you come in here. <laughs> Um, and you know, try to try to forget the person and hear God. So that is um, the prophetic office. I knew I should have stapled these things. I'd get them all messed up. Um, the glory of the pastor's prophetic image, um, and then the glory of the pastor's priestly ministry. So look at, turn if you would to 2 Timothy 3. We're going to read uh, verses 10 to 17. Second Timothy three ten to seventeen. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus." All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So Chapel takes this passage and pulls from it the ways in which a pastor should... Um, fulfill a priestly office. Um, and if you, so verses 10, 14, and 17, um, carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, uh, 14, continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, and 17, um, that the man of God may be complete. One principle to be drawn from that is the pastor's life um, is part of his instruction. My, my example to you should be one that is godly. Uh, because if it's not, then whatever I say about living in a godly way is going to be useless. Uh, it's, it's not going to be credible to you. Um, but Chapel builds on the idea that um, because it is God's word and it is as if God himself were speaking to you when you hear sound preaching... Um, Chapel says, since we are speaking as Jesus, we should concern ourselves for his glory and how we conduct ourselves. 
by preaching the imperatives of Scripture and the provisions of the Redeemer and administering the sacraments, pastors verbally and symbolically teach God's people of the holiness he requires and provides, but no lesson is more important than the life of the pastor. He takes from verses 10 and 12 um, the principle that uh, Christ's priestly care for his people is made glorious and present in the church as Christ's servants give of themselves for the sake of the present generation. Um, and verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, um, and then all, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Um, a pastor should expect and um, be prepared to respond to uh, persecution, um, contention, difficulty, um, uh, in the way that Christ did. Um, it, you know, responding to those things in a godly manner. Um, as part of, uh, you know, being an example to uh, the people, uh, how, how do you deal with difficulties? Um, he, uh, Chapel says, Jesus suffered for the sins of others. When the divine son offered himself as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God, the glory of redemption, redemption shined brightly. We, when, we, when we who pastor endure the persecutions of the world for the sake of safeguarding the purity of the church or promoting the holiness of our people, then we are suffering for the good of others and also reflecting Christ's redemptive glory. And then finally from this uh, aspect of the pastor's priestly role um, is intercession. Um, Christ's priestly care for his people is made glorious and present. Uh, well, uh, in, I think I read this in the in the church as Christ's servants give of themselves for the sake of the present generation. All pastors who are faithful in representing Christ should expect the challenges of his priestly office. As we endure for Jesus' sake, we more deeply understand and more brightly mirror the glory of his suffering on our behalf. Uh, and you know, that, that's a that's a that's true of a pastor, but it's true certainly of any Christian um, when you are persecuted for your faith. Um, and then the last of these, the the pastor's kingly ministry. Um, look with me at. Uh, um, let me double check this. I think I've got a. Yeah, okay, it's 2 Timothy 4, uh, verses 1 and 2. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Um. So we're to we're to be <clears throat> patient, long suffering, um, but to lead with authority. Um, <clears throat> the way the chapel speaks of this, he says, since Christ is present, so also 
is the glory of his resurrection power. Though he once died, he speaks in his word, indwells us, and will appear to judge the world. Christ's kingship is reflected in the authority the pastor possesses in preaching the word. And this was, here's the, here's the kicker. Eternity changes with the preaching of the word. Its power is that great and glorious. It's the word that's um, great and glorious, but it's communicated by preaching. Um, so, you know, so in in trying to, you know, think through the glory of God as it applies to pastoral ministry, um, these are uh, things to think about. You know, in what ways does does the pastor reflect the offices of Christ? But ultimately, the the goal is that the church corporately will reflect the glory of Christ. That's what we're working toward. You know, that is the direction that we're trying to lead in. Um, and so uh, it's not only the individuals uh, that we're concerned about as pastors, but it's the, the witness of the church as a whole. What does, uh, what is the witness of Cornerstone Baptist Church? Um, and there's a, you know, there, there are a lot of things that come into that consideration, but, um, you know, one of the things that I think about uh, when I think about the way that I want the, cornerstone to, to be uh, uh, seen and and um, what, what what is the reputation you know um, I never want it to be said of cornerstone what is said so much about so many churches that it's full of hypocrites <laughs> um, and um, That you know, so that that re that that requires careful shepherding, um, faithful preaching, um, and, and leading by example. A chapel says this. Um, let me see if I've got the right. Um, As pastors lead bodies of believers in loving one another helping and forgiving one another, praying for the work of Christ, Christ in their midst, supporting each other in joy and in sorrow, equipping disciples for united ministry, showing mercy to outsiders, serving together in harmony and praising the God who enables it all. Then churches reflect Jesus' character and fulfill his calling. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I encourage you to, um, actually get the book and read it, uh, to know more about these things. Um, so that's three books you need to read before too long. Um, next, so this was supposed to be a two-week lesson, but, uh, um, I'm going to be away next week and we're shuffling things around a little bit so uh, Pastor Mark is going to teach Sunday school next week and I'm not sure exactly what he's going to teach maybe he'll add more to, to the subject of pastoral theology but um, after that I think we'll, we'll go on to the next section of the book okay let's pray sorry to keep you too long Father in heaven, um, 
we uh, just thank you for uh, your wisdom in um, establishing the church and uh, providing for us all uh, this means of grace that um, we need to um, walk um, rightly, to, to walk in the Spirit, to um, understand all the things that you have obeyed, uh, that you've commanded, um, how to obey them, and, um, and Lord, how to uh, delight in doing so. Uh, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.